Welcome to the Eating at a Meeting podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Stuckroff, dietary needs expert, certified meetings manager, certified food protection manager. I have searched the globe to find people and businesses who are creating safe, sustainable, and inclusive food and beverage experiences for their employees, guests, and communities. In each episode, you will find authentic conversations about how food and beverage impacts inclusion, sustainability, culture, community, health, and wellness. I know that sounds like a lot, but we're going to cover it all. Are you ready to feed engagement, nourish inclusion, and bolster your bottom line? If so, let's go. So on today's show, I'm so excited to introduce you to Len Senator. He is the founder of The Dep in Toronto. He is also the co-founder of The Newcomer Kitchen, a nonprofit food project that supported Syrian refugees, refugee women, and the author of the forthcoming book, De Panner Cookbook, to be published by Simon & Schuster in 2023. Hey, Len, how are you? Hello. Thanks for having me. This is really fun. So tell us a little bit about yourself and what is The Dep and what and how did you get into this? Okay. Well, so... The Depener is a a venue that I started in Toronto, which was designed to showcase the incredible diversity of culinary talent in the city, both amateur and professional. So it became a venue dedicated to hosting pop-up food events. And over the course of 10, 11 years, we hosted thousands of unique food events from drop-in dinners to sort of sit-down supper clubs to classes and workshops and brunch residencies and private events and all of these things in a tiny 450-square-foot renovated corner store that was home to all of this stuff. And then we were hosting all of these different types of food events. I basically had this peculiar kind of restaurant that invites total strangers to do all the cooking. And so when in 2016, when the Canadian government decided to invite 25,000 Syrian refugees to, to resettle, a lot of them were kind of stuck in hotels being processed, waiting to found housing. And at that time, they had kitchens and no way to prepare food for themselves or their family. And so I was like, well, I have this space, I have this kitchen, why don't we just extend the invitation to them? They can make some familiar food, share a meal, bring some leftovers home for their friends. And we did, and that sort of took off and it became a multi-year pilot where we invited Syrian women to come prepare food, sell it to the community, and then pass the money to them and use this as a bridge to create social and economic opportunities. That's amazing. And and I love the fact, I mean, you just said it basically, but when I posted it on Facebook into into one of the Facebook groups about food and society, you're like, I'm a person who has hosted a thousand dinner parties and worked with hundreds of amateur and professional cooks from all over the world. Drop me a line if you want to talk to me. And I just love it. And a couple of people gave totally thumbs up. We want to hear about this. So, and I just think it's really just before the show started, you and I were chatting about what the word pop-up is because an event is kind of a pop-up, but this is really more interest, more restaurant related mm-hmm. and more of that amateur chef. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about what a pop-up, because people might not understand what a pop-up is because it's here and there and it's, or it's gone. Yeah. Well, I became interested in the phenomenon of, so I used to be a designer for many years and then I took a sort of uh, transition. I wanted to kind of get involved and I've always kind of gone through life stomach first. And so I sort of decided that I wanted to do something <laughs> involving food, uh-huh. but I didn't, wasn't sure exactly what that was. And I was, became intrigued by this phenomenon of pop-up dining that I saw happening in other cities around the world where a restaurant would like spring into existence for one night or one week or one month in a particular place before vanishing. And it seemed like there was a lot of really fun and interesting possibility sort of on the margins or outside the formal restaurant model. And I became intrigued. There was one in San Francisco called the uh, San Francisco Underground Market, which was like Mm -hmm. a night market, but it was really focused on talented home cooks rather than on sort of established or professional chefs. And that really intrigued me. I've always liked home cooking better than fine dining. And so this was really my bag. And I knew that I didn't want to frantically cook the same thing every day for the same, for people I never get to meet. So like this idea really appealed to me. And then I tried to find more pop-up things happening in Toronto and I found them like basically extremely rare. And I was trying to figure out why that was. And I kind of came to the conclusion that it was so prohibitively expensive to set up the infrastructure to do a pop-up, like a one-off pop-up event that you needed like tons of money just to do it. And then the resulting event had to be really expensive to cover all those costs. And so that only people with tons of money could go to them. And then the whole thing becomes this kind of insular elitist 
thing that just didn't interest me. So I was like, well, what if, what if I actually had a dedicated venue that had everything you needed right. so you didn't have to reinvent that wheel? Then you could like radically lower the barrier to participation and you could have a far more interesting and diverse group of people come and cook. And then the resulting events could be a lot more modest and you could have a far more interesting and diverse group of people come and dine. Mm -hmm. And I kind of ran with that idea. And so did you have, did you go searching out for these or did people just start coming to you? It was a mix, right? Like, so in the early days, I mean, people didn't know. So I would go to like food truck events or pop-up food markets or night markets mm -hmm. or put the word out and invite. I say, hey, I think what you're doing is awesome. We should come and do a night at my place and we can do a dinner and, and kind of built it up slowly and organically. And I mean, I did kind of bank on the idea that the notion itself was inherently viral in a certain way. You come right. to this dinner party, you have this dinner by some amateur cook. You're like, oh, this is awesome. Oh, I know somebody who would love to do this, right? right? And so they would pass the word. And so over the years, as I built an audience and that audience sort of evangelized what we were doing and it became more known and seen, then it became this mix of my outreach, but also people finding out about it and coming to me. And we were able, I mean, what was remarkable is for 11 years, we just kept it full, like almost every day of the week. There was never a shortage wow. of, of talent. That's amazing. And when you brought the Syrian refugee women in there, mm -hmm. did that, was that like every single day that you did that? Or is that once a week? Well, again, or? it started off just as a small gesture of hospitality. Right. It was like, mm -hmm. come use the kitchen. Right. And it was a remarkable story because we, we didn't know anything about the situation. I was just like, we wanted to help. I didn't know how. I'm like, I have a kitchen. So just start where, start where you are, use what you have, do right. what you can. So I'm like, we finally found a way of getting the word out through this. It was me and the co-founder, Kara Benjamin Pace, put the word out. It, it landed with this remarkable young Syrian couple, Rahaf and uh, Ismail. They took the word back to their hotel and they basically organized a little field trip to do some cooking. And they came down on a cold April morning and they uh -huh. did some of them for the, some of them. It was the first time they'd ever left the hotel that ever ventured into the wow. city, ever been on the public transit system. It was like talks about how strong the draw of the kitchen right. really is. And then they came and they weren't sure what is this whole weird thing. And I was just like, you know what, guys, just cook whatever you want. We'll talk about it later. And once they realized that they could cook. They were just like, get out of my way. And they just sort of took over the whole kitchen. And all of a sudden, all this like pots are bubbling and all the people are laughing. And, and it was clear that we were just doing a great thing. And so we just kind of did it. Uh, no particular plan. And then it picked up a lot of momentum. People, certainly within the Depener community, we've been doing that for about five years. We had been, I'd been running the Depener for about five years at that point. And so we had a community. They were super enthusiastic. Everybody was excited about it. So we're like, all right, let's do it again. And let's do it again. And then at a certain point, I'm like, okay, I was just sort of paying for it just because whatever. And then I'm like, I can't afford to actually do this. And they were also at this point being relocated into homes. Now the second issue was like, can they actually make any income from this? Do they, is there any job opportunity here? So we're like, well, I already sell event tickets on my website. I mean, I've been doing this for many years. Let's see if we can do this in a way that makes enough money to pay for everything. And so we just started to say, okay, we're going to make some extra meals. They're available for sale. Who wants them? And there was just this huge enthusiasm for the idea. And so we were able to quickly scale it up to making 50 meals uh, once a week. It would be about a group of about six to eight ladies that would come in. They would prepare 50 meals. We'd package everything up. We'd sell them into the community. And it was it paid for enough to pay for all the ingredients and the overhead and then be able to split, you know, to, to distribute all of the proceeds to the women. And they were able to go home with pocket money and economic wow. and social engagement and all of this amazing support from the community that really fundamentally respectful and equitable. It wasn't an act of charity. It wasn't. A, it was like they were earning this money contributing something valuable that the market was really thrilled to actually come up and purchase. And right. it was a really great exchange. Now, uh, two questions for that. The age range of the women cooking, was it young women, older women? It was, it was huge. I mean, you know, the a lot of them at the beginning were actually bringing their young kids because the women were primary caregivers. So you had like young mothers with their young kids. And then you had like older mothers. You really had like a generate from like, like late teens to like 80s like we really wow. have a gigantic range and i'll also add out this is an incredibly diverse group of women i mean you have and that's the thing about refugees is that you get this incredible cross-section of the community many of whom would never have necessarily hung out 
at home. So you have university educated Damascene urban professionals and illiterate peasant farmers and Druze and Christians and wow. all different stripes of Muslim and all of these people who in many ways have nothing in common yet have this all this <laughs> fundamental thing in common. Mm -hmm. And so they actually kind of came together in this space and made there was as much connection within the community as there was a bridge between the Syrian community and the Canadian community. So one of the things that emerged, it was really fascinating to see. Well, and you had the prime minister Trudeau come. Yeah. And how did that go? Well, I mean, so this thing picked up a lot of momentum over the, mm -hmm. the first year that we were doing it. It became sort of local news and then national news and then international news as a showing a sort of response to this global mm -hmm. humanitarian crisis. That was, that it was a feel good story about a feel bad situation. And so it, it had a hook, people liked it. And right. they it didn't take a lot of figuring out to see why this was a good thing. So people right. saw it, they're like, yeah, this is great. And so there was a when the one year anniversary of the Syrians arrival and came around, the, the prime minister at the time was looking for a way to sort of mark that occasion and was looking for somewhere in Canada that they felt sort of was emblematic of this new community. And they chose this project to host this sort of round table. And so, yeah, at that time we, we had a visit from the prime minister and it really spoke to kind of what was possible out of this tiny little corner store with a handful of ragtag people. Right. And it's not that the project didn't have its challenges. And as we tried to figure out how to pay for it, because I mean, it, it covered its costs, but right. it didn't, there was no money to run the actual program. So gotcha. you know, we needed to figure out a way to support yeah, the running of it, and that was represented a big challenge. And so we were taking advantage of the promotional or publicity opportunities right. that we had as we tried to navigate towards turning it into a legitimate and sustainable nonprofit organization. Now, one of the questions that we had chatted bef about beforehand was how this enabled you to build community through the food. And you kind of touched on that, but mm -hmm. I mean, you've got farmers and, and different people. And so, mm -hmm. and I think you said it's like, it really did bridge the Canadian community with this new yeah. Syrian, their new Syrian yeah. members of the community. Well, it was an extension of what the Depener already did. I mean, this was right. one particular pilot project that we ran that ran once a week for a few years. And it, it became a very high profile part of what we did, but it was built on a multi-year history of hosting dinners right. and hosting events that invited all kinds of different people from all different places in the world to share their food and culture and culinary ideas in this sort of fun, intimate, and directly accessible, experiential way. Right. And so these, the core values of connecting people through food, creating economic opportunity through grassroots food and engagement, and all of these sort of things, and in diversity and inclusion through participation in food and lowering the barriers to access and all of these ideas just found their kind of ultimate expression in this particular project, but it was something that ran from the beginning and continued even after the project moved on from the Depener. That's so, so it's still running, just it's not still there. running as a nonprofit organization in Toronto. I mean, it had to evolve for a number of right. reasons. It had to evolve because, well, how long are you a newcomer after how many years, right? right. How do we extend this benefits to new newcomers? Right. Uh, also, we had to adapt into the reality of we had to become what they had, it had to become what the government was willing to fund. Gotcha. Right, which was okay. different than what necessarily we had originally done. And we were facing a different challenges in a different mm -hmm. context. So it's now under the executive directorship of Kara Benjamin Pace. And Tamar Chaikin is the sort of managing director of the uh, sort of general activities, the operations. And yeah, and it has its own thing. And it's, tra it's developing cohorts of diverse multicultural women and doing entrepreneurship training. That's amazing. Now, and before, and I, there were so many fascinating things you said to me just before we came on, like on here and, and actually before, but food is more than just food. Mm -hmm. And talk, talk to the listeners about what that means to you. Well, I mean, there probably isn't a dimension of human culture and experience that food doesn't touch or intersect with in some way. I mean, it's the most fundamental, most universal of all human experiences. There's never been a person in any time in all of history that doesn't eat. So it's something we fundamentally all have in common. And as such, it leaps across these barriers of language and culture and age and race and gender and class and history and things to, to find the sort of common ground. I think James Beard said, food is our common ground. Yep. And so, but what does the re traditional restaurant do that actually takes advantage of 
this remarkable and unique thing that food is capable of. And so I was, that's the part that really intrigued me. And, and I would look at a restaurant, you go, you order, you eat, you leave. And it's kind of a missed opportunity to do right. something. And so I was more interested in doing that thing than I was in the food itself. Right. And so, so, and, and to, di- to dive deeper into the places that food intersects with other stuff, one of the events that we used to host was a series of table talks. So once a month, I'd invite a guest speaker to come and talk on some subject that passionate or interested about. And that would be the once a month that I would cook. So I would make up a menu because I'm not a chef, but I, I can cook and I enjoy right. it. But I, so I would come up with a menu that was sort of reflected or embodied the themes or topics of their talk. And then we would invite everyone to like come and have a dinner and then listen to the person talk and have this kind of informal dinner table Q and A. And so we could actually dive deeper into all kinds of different issues, whether it's food and literature or food and history or food and politics or, and so, yeah, that's about that. So I've always believed that food is more than just food. And as such, the depreneur was more than just a restaurant food. It was a restaurant was more than a restaurant. And uh, we have this cookbook coming out, which is our sort of COVID project. Mm-hmm. And I think it'll be more than just a cookbook. Well, I think so too. And and you had told me that you had written what, 90,000 words? Yeah, I kind of, I was the only piece of writing advice I was given the entire time was keep writing. So I did. And then it turned out to be way too much. So it's, I have a whole separate book now that one day oh, might that's find. Awesome. I think, mm-hmm. and now I'm, I've sort of been tasked at the last minute to write the Cole's notes of that book to okay. include as the introduction uh, for the actual cookbook. And that's going well. We're getting very close to the final deadline. So I'm happy with how that's coming together. So we're going to we'll talk a little bit about the story of the origin story of the DEP and a little bit of the philosophy and manifesto of the DEP. And then there's going to be a section sort of talking to Newcomer Kitchen at Peace on Its Own. And in this, it's all being wrapped around a hundred different recipes from a hundred different chefs from 80 different nationalities whom we all interviewed as well. And I sort of extracted some of their stories. So it's kind of become this sort of like humans of New York of food of Toronto, right. In conjunction with this cookbook and the story of this very unlikely restaurant and the, the little corner store that could. I, I like that. The little corner store that could. So out of <coughs> like some of those stories, what's like, what are some of the, what, what's one story that just really resonates with you? Wow. There's so many. It's hard to, that's one of the challenges when you host like thousands and thousands of these events. I mean, we were for in our, in the sort of peak period, we were doing, oh, I was more or less single-handedly doing 300 events a year in, in wow. my space. So there was a lot going on and it was like mm-hmm. from like weddings to like dinner parties to all these things. I mean, one of the things that we did was uh, a few years ago, Canada was celebrating its ostensible 150th anniversary of its formal establishment. They called it Canada 150. And I just felt that was such a sort of short-sighted kind of description. It's like, you know, this, what we're calling Canada has been doing this a lot longer than that. And so I actually reached out to uh, Taylor Parker, who's a remarkable Indigenous chef, and said, can you come and do a Canada Day dinner called Canada 1500? Because I really think we need to reframe what we're talking about here. And it's like, that was an incredibly interesting uh, wow. experience. And so I invited him back as a sort of chef of honor every Canada day since then. And, and then one of the interesting things that he was always like reluctant because he does a lot of like hunting and foraging okay. as part of his things. And he was always reluctant to like, give me an exact menu. Right. And I was like, no, but if you don't have the menu, I, I mean, how are people going to buy tickets? They want to know. And he's like, but that's not how it works. And anyway, so we, we kind of would compromise. And then we had, I remember we had one event where he was, it's called Hunt and Gather, and he was going to actually take some other chefs on this like ice fishing trip and hunting thing, and then they were going to come back and cook all the stuff that they made. Uh-huh. And I was like, great, and I was writing all the stuff up, and then they went, and they didn't catch anything, <laughs> right? And he's and and then sort of without actually telling me, he's like, yeah, that's why I don't give you that because that's not how the supermarket of Mother Nature works. You right. don't get to eat whatever you want, whenever you want. And that actually made me realize just sort of how deeply colonial, like the whole restaurant model really is to just assume that I can eat the same thing all the Mm -hmm. time, anytime, whenever I want, no matter where there's in season, no matter where it comes from. And maybe even re-examining that Mm -hmm. is something we kind of need to move towards. Well, and that just jumps me to the standard banquet menus that you get at hotels and convention centers. Here's the Italian, here's the Mexican, here's the Asian buffet, and this is what you're going to get, right? Mm -hmm. We need to come back to 
kind of doing that hunting gathering. What can we get locally? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, I mean, uh, Dan Barber talks a lot about it in Mm -hmm. in his book, The Third Plate. There's a lot of ideas that we need to kind of like reconsider cost and convenience as the primary driver of Mm -hmm. our food choices and look more at both what positive a sort of intervention that food can do in our choices of what we procure and where and how and why. And we as consumers of food need to be more interested in and, and also be willing to make little compromises around what we eat and when, because we're, this is our sort of participatory dialogue with the environment, with the terroir, with, and then the chefs use their skill and their knowledge and their expertise to make that delicious. Right. Right. And so I think all of us working together can try to sort of shift the focus of food and how we engage with it and try to help it be more of a force for positive change and less of a force for the sort of negative and unsustainable sort of status quo. Yeah. I mean, it's that institutional dining, not just with restaurants, but with, we were talking about it before the show with hospitals and, and whatever, and how we can, instead of it being the number one expense for meeting planner, how can Mm -hmm. we use it as a tool to do those connections? Well, I think you can really try to align. Like if you're having a particular event, what is the function or purpose of that event? Mm -hmm. Right. Is it a wedding that you're trying to keep this sort of like wish fulfillment, sort of luxury fantasy? Is it uh, a corporate event where you're trying to like motivate people and get them connected and engaged with team building? I mean, you and then to sit down with the chef, right, or with the planner and say, how can we use food to get everyone in that event closer to whatever that goal is a much better use of food than just to like stuff something in your pie hole until the next meeting. Like, right. And so, again, in the same way that the restaurant was a missed opportunity to connect people, I think sort of these standard menus that you're talking about are a missed opportunity to reach the goals of whatever your event is actually doing. Right, exactly. And it, it, and that recall, it takes a lot of different change from a, little, a lot of different perspectives, from mm-hmm. institutional corporate buying mm-hmm. to regional buying mm-hmm. and chefs and, and what they're trained on and how they do that. And then meeting planners, thinking mm-hmm. about it a lot more purposeful. I mean, I find like for even something like being involved in the preparation of the food Mm -hmm. is probably one of the most profound team building activities that you can actually do. I mean, collectively cooking something, which is essentially how everything was cooked from almost all of human history, right? right, Is the way we form connections and bonds and trust and figure out who's got which skills and it's all done. Mm -hmm. And then you sit down and share immediately the result of your yep. collaboration that connects people in a way that doing a trust fall or I don't know, whatever kind of like <laughs> thing playing laser tag or uh, is just right. not going to do. And so here it is food, food could be doing the very th- thing that you're having your event to do better than your event. If you were just to use food to do it. Oh, that's so like, I want to do that. I just want to make that happen oh, just instantaneously. Right. <laughs> The you had on your Twitter description that I loved it is a place where interesting thing, interesting food things happen. Yeah. And and I think that what you just said re, kind of reiterates that. Yeah. So that's sort of the slogan of the mm-hmm. day. And uh, it sort of ties into this idea that it's not about like the fanciest niche. It's never going to be the same. I couldn't even get a restaurant review because we never served the same thing twice. Right. So oh. it's like we're not I, to call it a restaurant is didn't really work because it it just was something else. So that was the only way I could kind of summarize it in a, in a couple of words, but it was also, I mean, it also ties to the name of the place. So just for those who don't know, so the Depaneur, Mm -hmm. I'm actually calling you now from Quebec, from a friend's house where I'm staying in Quebec. And I'm originally from Montreal myself, even though I live in Toronto now. And in, in, in all of Quebec and French Canada, the Depaneur is what you call the corner store. Right. Okay. It's the, it's the slang, the way you'd say bodega or convenience mm-hmm. store or whatever. It's that's in Quebec. And so it's unique to Quebec. The etymology is kind of interesting. So if you were like driving down the street and your car breaks down, you might say, Oh, je suis en ben, meaning like I'm stuck, I'm in trouble, I'm in a jam. Okay. So the dépanneur is the person who comes and gets you unstuck or out of trouble. Oh, I love right? that. 
And so I guess in Quebec, in France, it would be like a tow truck driver or like a roadside assistance would be a debenner. But in Quebec, it was like, I guess someone was like, oh, man, it's 1030 and I, I need beer and cigarettes and snacks. It's like, oh, you're open. Awesome. You say you totally got me out of this jam. You, you know, Depané. And so it became known as the Depaneur. And so I took over in Toronto. I took over what was an old corner store. How and, so cool. And I was a Montrealer, nostalgic for the kind of the difference of how Bohemian, my Bohemian early artist days in Montreal. And I said, okay, I'm a, I'm a nostalgic Montrealer with a corner store. I'm going to call it the Depaneur. But also, I thought that food in Toronto and maybe in general was a little bit en peine. Mm -hmm. And maybe I could le dépanner a little bit. And that's what I... And I think you've done a really good job about that. <laughs> yeah. I wish I could have... And are, what are your... Now that you're on a sabbatical, because you've taken... An, a, you're taking a year off to write yeah. the cookbook and write the second book and other things, right? Whatever yeah. pops up into your agenda here. So do you... Where do you see it going? Well, so just to clarify, so two years ago, I was actually hitting the limits of this little tiny space. Like we were just packed every single day, all of the events, were, and the rent had essentially tripled up from under me. So even though I was content to just keep doing what I was doing, it was not becoming, I was sort of at the growth maximum. There was nowhere to expand and it was just rising. So I'm like, started to think a lot about where do I go next? Mm -hmm. And I got it and I said, okay, I need to, I don't care if it makes more money. I, I just, I don't want to work so much. It's just too much work. It's very hard. Right. Right. And so I, and I spoke to my mentors and advisors and they were like, you might actually have to work less. You might actually have to make more money if you want to work less. And I was like, oh, okay. So I started thinking about expansion and new spaces and bigger things and economies of scale. And then I started to just get really overwhelmed. And I'm like, I, I can't plan and execute a whole new depreneur while I'm running 300 events a year. Right. Right. So I'm because like, it's just you. Yeah. I mean, I've had great people helping me throughout, but not, it was always three people worth of work and one and a half people worth of revenue. Right. So, and so I was just, so I kind of was looking at this feeling stressed out. And then I said, you know what? You can't change the tires while the car is moving. You just got to park this thing for a bit, take a rest, think carefully and deeply about what it is that I want to, where I want to go with it. Mm -hmm. And then purposefully and intentionally work towards that. And I decided that. And then like three months later, COVID. Mm. And one of the interesting lessons was I was encountering all of these problems of growth that was mm -hmm. like causing all of these challenges. And so I was like, I have to grow. And then all of a sudden I turned around and had I actually got a new lease and doubled down on an expensive new build out and expanded and then walked into COVID with that, it would have been totally catastrophic. Mm -hmm. So ironically, and, and perhaps profoundly, the smallness, which was what I was pushing against, actually ended up being the saving grace. And I could dial it back down to a one-man operation and navigate yeah. through COVID. And so when we were suddenly really constrained in what we could do in terms of events, I was on pen. <laughs> to depanner the situation. I was like, well, what can we actually do? If I start with what I start where I am, use what I have, do what I can. It's like, what can I do? And I said, well, I have all these amazing cooks that have been here through the last decade. Why don't we try to celebrate them in another way? So we, I had this idea of doing a cookbook, showcasing a hundred of these different cooks. Mm -hmm. And then I started doing my research and due diligence. And I discovered that Probably the only thing worse than the restaurant business model is the cookbook publishing business model. It's just like an absolute disaster. So I became clear that because one of the important things about the dev is everybody always got paid, right? For what it was shared risk, shared reward. If we had a great night, we both made good money. If we had a terrible night, we both took a hit. That was always the fundamental premise. So I wasn't going to like do that for 10 years and then tell everybody to donate to the cookbook for free. So right. everyone was going to get paid to be in this. And with a hundred people, even in an honorarium, right, there was plus the photography, like there was no way to pay for this using what I could expect to get from a Canadian publisher. So right. I said, all right, so we turned it around and went to the community and we did a, did, launched it as a Kickstarter. And the Kickstarter went on to become the most funded Canadian cookbook ever. Wow. And, uh, yeah. And we sold, you know, like more than 700 advanced copies and raised enough money to like launch the whole book and also to validate the project enough that I was actually then able to take it to a major publisher, or just to several major publishers actually, and 
negotiate the backing of a publisher who would otherwise maybe be reluctant to give this relatively obscure first time author, you know, a, a chance on the national stage. So it worked out really well and it was really built. It is both built on and a product of the legacy of the last 10 years of the Debonair. That's really cool. And I'm so glad that, I mean, you've sold seven. I need to go buy one too. put my money in that. It's coming out in 2023. Exactly. The beginning or the end. I don't know quite yet because it is a very long, slow involved process and doing a anthology of a hundred different contributors, some of whom have never used a recipe or English isn't their first. It turns out it's actually a lot of work who would have thought. (laughs) Well, and That just you saying that who's never used a recipe just made it from it reminds me of Pilar from last week and just talking about the food traditions. I'm like, when you invited those Syrian refugee women into the DAP to cook, they're just cooking what they know and what mm-hmm. they love. And maybe they and didn't boy, bring do, do some of them know it. I mean, we're talking right. like if you have 10 kids and 45 grandkids, you've been running a restaurant your whole life. We were talking about the recipes Mm -hmm. and how saving the traditions Mm -hmm. of these refugees who are coming to new cultures. And so they have to learn what one to cook with new food types Mm -hmm. for one, possibly with us, but their memory of Mm -hmm. the dishes that they made. Well, I I knew I understood this in the abstract at one point. But then I remember in the early days of the Depeneur, we actually had a, a visitor from Anissa Halu, who's a very preeminent figure in the world of Islamic food. She's a famous cookbook author. And uh, she was speaking at ter- the terroir symposium, which is a big food industry sort of uh, thing in Canada. And she was the guest- keynote speaker. And she had heard about the project and came to speak to check it out. And, and when she spoke to me, and she made it really clear that the stakes here are high, that one of the most ancient culinary traditions in the world, I mean, we're talking tiger food of the Western world. And mm-hmm. it's a sort of unbroken just tradition that's evolved. And it's not owned by celebrity chefs and Michelin stars and fancy things. It's owned by these women and these mothers and these grandmothers cooking in their unique ways, in their unique villages. And what happens to all of that knowledge Mm -hmm. when 6 million people are like thrust into diaspora around the world, coming to a place where you buy hummus in a tub at the supermarket and no one's ever heard of this ingredient or that herb. Mm -hmm. And it became clear that what we were doing, even though this wasn't the the focus was like we were communicating silently that that knowledge is valuable that mm-hmm. it's and that people value it and that they see value in it and they're willing to pay for it and encouraging them to like hold on to it and so we became about something much more than just earning a little pocket money or whatever and and then i started to think deeply about this too that you don't get to have a culinary tradition for 5000 years mm-hmm. unless that tradition itself can be repeated generation after generation, that itself is a technology of sustainability on what can be extracted from your community, continually generation after generation. And so I was like, well, what if we could reframe this whole thing? What if it wasn't about all the things we think we need to teach them about getting a credit card or signing up for a cell phone plan or whatever nonsense, and we could just shut up for a second and actually listen deeply to what we might learn and then... I mean, we've been, Canada's been here, what, like 300 years? I mean, look what we've done to the place. So it's like if we could actually hear, we might actually get the most important lesson of our lives. Oh, that's amazing. It it really is. I mean, because you're, it, it, it reminds me of my grandmother. She made this succotash. None of us know how to, how she made that succotash. And she passed away. 15 years ago, none of us can figure out how to do it. And my other grandmother who passed away three years ago, I don't really know the recipes that she did. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I really wish that I did. I mean, Mm -hmm. I have my mom's recipes that she does and I recreate those, but how do you, it's a shame that Mm -hmm. I don't, we don't have my grandmother's crab cake recipe and her succotash recipe. Yeah. Well, they connect you like humanly and personally to that family, to that Mm -hmm. tradition. And then more deeply embedded in those recipes are where those ingredients come from, your relationship Mm -hmm. to them, the stories that they embody. And then in that is the politics and the history that shaped those things. And so like, yeah, through those recipes, we connect to all of our human legacy. So amazing. I wish we could talk for so much longer. So before we, because we're getting up on that 40 minute mark, what do you... 
what is your favorite food and drink? Now that's pretty tough, right? I can, I don't know. If I can talk about a specific dish, but I can talk mm -hmm. about the characteristics that it has. It's like I don't. I'm not necessarily interested in fine dining and elaborately plated things. Food that's really expensive. The idea of like food as a kind of like status symbol really doesn't sit with me. So it's the food that it's made with love, that has a story that comes with it. It comes from somewhere. If it comes from a place, it comes from a family, it comes from a recipe from your grandmother, whatever. And then people, it's made with this fundamental spirit of hospitality and generosity. And then you sit down and you share it and you share it with the people who made it, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and you have this experience that uses that food as the connect that connects you to each other, to the stories embedded in things. That's where it happens. And that's what I tried to put on the center of the plate. When you have, I mean, one of the things I'll say about the Depeners event is we had communal dining, right? Okay. It was like a big table. You have eight people. We put big platters on the thing and everybody, it was the only restaurant I've ever been to where total strangers pass and serve food to each other. Wow. Right? It's a fundamentally different quality of experience. And it's not for everybody. Not everybody wants to like go to a dinner party. Sometimes you just want to grab right. a snack or you don't want to make small talk, chit chat with strangers. But, you know, how hard is it to find new friends and meet new people in a big city? So mm -hmm. there were there's something else on offer. Food, like you said, is so much more than food. And that's a big part of what I did. And I really hope to, to do more of that. And I guess now, I mean, another way of saying it is I love to, like, be, to eat in someone's home, wherever, mm -hmm. anywhere in the world, try new things. And you can only do so much. And as the old saying goes, if Muhammad can't go to the mountain, then you bring the mountain to Muhammad. And so by hosting this thousand dinners... I brought the whole world into my kitchen and got to have those meals without ever leaving my city. Oh, I'm just so impressed by you and inspired. <laughs> well, thank you. That's very sweet. You're welcome. Okay. So everybody, this is Len Senator and he is the founder of the Depanere. I said it right. Um, in Toronto, he is taking a sabbatical to write a cookbook on his experiences at the Depanere with a hundred different from around the world. So recipes from 80 different countries, et cetera. Yeah. So check it out. Every I put the links in there in the bottom um, so you can find him, follow him, stay on track with his book when it comes out. And Lynn, thank you so much for what you do. Oh, my pleasure. It's, it's a lot of fun and it's very tasty to do it. It's only very tasty to do it. I would love to do that. Yeah. So everybody, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening to the Eating at a Meeting podcast. We are here live every Wednesday on now on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And every Tuesday, a new audio podcast drops onto your favorite podcast platform. So make sure that you download that. We've got 118 episodes published this as of this week. So thank you for tuning in and, and checking us out. Until next time, everybody, see you soon. Thanks for listening to the Eating at a Meeting podcast, where every meal matters. I'm Tracy Stuckrath, your food and beverage inclusion expert. Call me and let's get started right now on creating safe and inclusive food and beverage experiences for your customers, your employees, and your communities. Share the podcast with your friends and colleagues at our Eating at a Meeting Facebook page and on all podcast platforms. To learn more about me and receive valuable information, go to tracystuckrath.com. And if you'd like more information on how to feed engagement, nourish inclusion and bolster your bottom line, then visit eatingatameeting.com.